Glory to Jesus Christ. Slave Susu Christu. Welcome to our St. Nicholas adult class where we are covering, we are in week five of covering Mother Maria Skoptsova, Essential Writings by Jim Forrest. This past week, we read chapters six, seven, and eight. And this coming week will be the last week that we have class, uh, having finished the rest of the reading of the book. But before we really begin, we will begin with a prayer before beginning a task. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of your eternal Father, you have said with your most pure lips, without me you can do nothing. My Lord, with faith I hold in my heart and soul these words spoken by you. Help us to complete this book study for the glory of your holy name. For you are a good God who loves mankind. And we give glory to you, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever. Okay. I am going to once more put in here my email address so that anybody who will be joining us viewing this later will be able to reach out if they have any questions or would like to know more about our book study okay as usual i will run through some things that stood out to me as i was reading chapter six is called toward a new monasticism two five having been toward a new monasticism one and these are her writings she speaks about the three vows of monastic profession, okay, three vows. And those three vows being obedience, a vow of obedience, a vow of chastity, and a vow of poverty or non-possession. She evaluates these vows of monastic profession and evaluates them in the current circumstances that she is going through, where my, like many other Russians, monastics, you are in a new place, a place where you are not familiar. You're in an unfamiliar place. And she speaks about how each vow must look in a new situation like this, being open to new situations. She makes no bending for the vow of chastity, of course. Uh, not bow, not, not, uh, not bending, but... Uh, not that she's talking about bending, but about giving it a new look. And the second vow, she says, they developed in opposite directions over the last two centuries. The vows of uh, the vows of obedience and non-possession, not having possessions. That the vow of poverty. She goes into an evaluation of spiritual poverty and what it looks like in their new situation, being uh, emigres out of Russia being in a new place and observing Russian monasticism in what it looked like in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, there being this blind obedience to a starets, a spiritual elder, right? Who takes responsibility for your spiritual well-being directly, directly. And she says, in the contemporary conditions of monastic life, there is no star chestvo, uh, starets life. Uh, or almost none, and that is natural. Uh, she further says, in the Russia of that time, the time that they are coming out of, with its many thousands of monks, there were always a few people of being a real startsi, a real spiritual elder. But now, that number is reduced to a few dozen monks, and so the choice is therefore reduced quite a bit. And so there is this she says at the bottom, any monk who happens to have been ordained several years ago can now become a starets, and his conscience tells him of his inexperience. And that is why he does not present his disciple with any particular demands, but limits his role to being useful to him as far as he can. The instruction has changed with this new situation. And so she says about this second vow on page 100, obedience as such remains unchanged but its meaning becomes different. She says, a monk should be obedient to the work of the church to which he is assigned. He should give his will and all his creative powers entirely to this work. 
Uh, she, she says, is this an innovation? Perhaps so, but here life itself is the innovator. The, in a new life, in a new situation, there are new demands. Uh, and she says of the third vow of poverty, of non-possession, this one she speaks as, uh, especially uh, at length about. She says uh, that the vow of non-possession is in need of greater comprehension and deepening. Saying today in secular life, the actual love of money is something extremely unreal. Everyone works in order to be able to feed himself and his family and dreams of nothing more. Here, a non-possessing monk will be one of the countless non-possessing people around him. Uh, we all know very well the worthlessness of material well-being. We have simply lost the habit of it. An ordinary emigre is essentially more of a non-possessor than an ordinary monk of older times. Such are the conditions of life. Uh, so she takes it further than material poverty. She takes it to the level of spiritual poverty, which to an extent has always been a part of it, but she decides to speak more at length about it. Um, and, and to be very clear, I'm not an authority on monastic living, but this is the way it has been taught to me uh, about what this life is. And so she, uh, she finds herself, she finds herself recommending a battle against this egocentrism. What is particularly contrary to non-possession is egocentrism, the disease of our time, she says. Uh, she goes on to say, egocentrism defines itself not so much by material miserliness and greed as by their spiritual manifestations, always relating everything and everyone to yourself, fighting against that. And I think this is a value to us. Not we are not. I am not a monastic by any means here. Uh, and yet, as Orthodox Christians, we are all called to embrace elements of monastic life. Okay. And so what she has to say has value for all faithful, I believe. Uh, she speaks of fighting an egocentric accumulation, uh, being greedy for spiritual and material riches. Uh, everything sprinkled with the words I and mine. Uh, quote, his friend is someone whom he needs and whom he wants to make use of. His family is his property, uh, his science, his art, his motherland. And she says, he is the center for which creation exists. This is what, uh, what uh, ought to be fought against, she is saying. Uh, Non-possession, on page 103, she says, non-possession should not be merely passive. They don't ask, so I don't give. Non-possession should be active. A monk should seek where to place the gifts given him by God precisely for that end. Ultimately, everything I have with the intention of it going to somebody else. Right. And I think that can be very true of any faithful. Right. Because. What does Christ teach us? Of course, he teaches us uh, to store up treasures in heaven. Right. He speaks of uh, one parable where a man stores up, builds up great barns to store his goods and then rests and relaxes. And then that night death comes for him. What was it all for? Right. All of it being his, his own, his own. Uh, I could, I could be that way about all of my things. I and and, and I very likely am. Uh, this is something that is not just of benefit, I think, to monasticism, but is also of great benefit to us as Christians, as as as, as children of God. Chapter seven is titled "The Poor in Spirit," and in this chapter, she speaks more at length about what it means about the vow of non-possession of being poor in spirit this reminds us of the this tastes of the beatitudes um, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven uh this is something that christ gives us in the chap in um in the gospel of matthew in uh the uh, the sermon on the mount famously he speaks a great it's where we even uh, receive the our father from him from the sermon on the mount uh, but he speaks at length about the beatitudes and so she is really coming after uh, and, and pointing out one particular beatitude, the poor be poor in spirit. Uh, so speaks more at length about everything that we have addressed in quite a bit. Um, 
But she goes further. She uh, looks deeply at the measure of love that Christ had. Uh, there's this one particular part on the bottom of page 105 where she says, Christ did not know measure in his love for people. So there was no measure of love. Uh, in this love, he reduced his divinity to the point of incarnation and took upon himself the suffering of the universe. In this sense, his example teaches us not to measure in love, not measure in love, but the absolute and boundless giving of ourselves determined by the laying down of our soul for our friends. And so she connects it with another point where no greater love uh, hath one than to lay down one's life for another. Right? Christ teaches us that as well. She's, she's deliberately using the teachings of Christ to emphasize the importance of giving yourself to the world. Uh, there was a particular line chapters ago where she says on page 78 this is a previous chapter but it's, it continues to stand out where she says the more we go out into the world the more we give ourselves to the world uh, the more we go out into the world the more we give ourselves to the world the less we are of the world because what is of the world does not give itself to the world it's, it's powerful powerful line uh that that keeps coming back time and time again she gives us an image further on page 106 the same page where she says the poor hold on to their rags and do not know that the only way not only to preserve them but also to make them precious is to give them with joy and love to those who need them she she's talking about all of us not just those who don't have many material goods uh for what are material goods uh she we she's calling us all the poor the poor hold on to their rags and do not know that the only way not only to preserve them but also to make them precious is to give them with joy and love to those who need them in that material and let's think about that that material goods increase in value the more that they are given the more that they are given this is how it's it's almost like um it's a strange way it's a strange sort of stock you know, if you ever if you're familiar with the stock market, that the value increases the more that you give it, that the more that you are giving of things, the more that the market value, spiritual market value for that good is increasing, right? As is your treasure uh, in heaven, you are gaining that. There's there's a strange sort of sense. Um, Saint Seraphim of Sarav often spoke of grace in terms of um, economics, to barter for grace, do whatever you can for grace. There is no greater treasure than God's grace. Uh, he would speak often of that. She is. She seems to be doing a little bit of that here. That the uh, to make things more precious is to give them with joy and love to those who need them. Uh, and at the very end, saying uh, the freedom of non-possession, the freedom of non-possession. That there is freedom in non-possession of being poor in spirit is truly being free. It's a very very impactful very short chapter just for three or four pages but very good and on chapter eight she calls it under the sign of our time under the sign of our time and she is speaking about being an immigrant of different emigres who came from russia and what is life for them what is life for them now in a place that is not their own and the freedom that they experience now, that, that strange sort of freedom to come and go in a place that is not theirs. Uh, she, uh, she has warnings for it. She has warnings for it, uh, words of caution about it. Uh, she even says on page 108, the result of what they're going through now is a certain caution in the souls of those who are connected with their national organism. This is those who maybe are very strong citizens. The great influence of this organism on each of its members constraint dependence. Uh, she paints citizenship in a particular way that uh, you can have great wealth if you invest in this legal system and follow the politics. Uh, you could have great wealth and success, right? Uh, but being an emigre, there is uh, something else at work. There is this un unusual freedom uh, where 
where she says the owner of the neighborhood bistro could not care less what regime we have, whether we believe in God or worship or, or we worship protoplasm. Uh, the, there's minimal order in the passports. The tax inspector collects our taxes. Those are our only ties with the external world. And our internal emigre world is too strengthless and bodiless to activity uh, to actively show its displeasure by this or that trend in its own milieu. Uh, so what does it mean for them? She's answering some of these questions. What does it mean for us who are emigres in a place like this? Uh, she has a very, she says, she says something very interesting on page 111 at the very top. She says, she says, I'm going to read at length here. There is a vast group of people in the church who understand orthodoxy as some attribute of their belonging to the old Russian state, as some sort of non-existent life, as a testimony of political loyalty and political right-mindedness. To a certain degree, this becomes our church's public opinion, issuing a patent for what is allowed and what is forbidden, seeking out heretics, dreaming of the time when the secular power with the force, the entire force of its punitive and police apparatus will preserve the purity of orthodoxy, while the church will condemn anti-government tendencies with its spiritual authority. She's painting a picture of church and state in uh, an old, in the old Russian state. This relationship where both are supporting each other, that uh, and that the the emigre are uh, believing that uh, sort of an adherence to orthodoxy. Um, is an adherence to that sort of ideal. Uh, and uh, and she goes on. But it is, I think what she's giving is sort of a warning against that, that freedom, quote, has burned them. She says on the top of page 112, uh, Russian people who find themselves torn away from their native soil, uh, they are not strong enough to bear the heavy burden of freedom and the absence of responsibility. The burden of freedom and the absence of responsibility. Freedom has burned them, she says. The desert turned out to be peopled by a dark force and the dark force has swallowed them. But is there something else in the emigration and what should this something else be? What would it have to be for the emigration to have inner spiritual meaning to justify itself? She says, first of all, we should understand the providential meaning of the freedom given us. We must receive it as a weighty gift and not only relate to it externally, but let it penetrate to the very depths of our spirit, rethink and test in its light all our usual and habitual opinions and bases. And she goes on if um, uh, later in that same paragraph uh, talks about we are tightly buttoned up in our worldview. We are well dressed and we are simply swaddled in it. And later on, the importance of much later on she speaks of the importance of church not not making church the place where you need to be uh, at peace with yourself uh, pointing out in particular that church is the place we go to be shaken up in our worldview to be shaken up in our sense of how we're doing or our sense of sin that calling us to repentance. She says, quote, on, on page 115, we cannot see the church as a sort of aesthetic perfection and limit ourselves to aesthetic swooning. Our God-given freedom calls us to activity and struggle. I'm reminded of her emphasis on free laboring for the Lord. And it would be a great lie to tell searching souls, go to church because there you will find peace. The opposite is true. She tells those, the church, tells those who are at peace and asleep, go to church because there you will feel real alarm about your sins, about your perdition, about the world's sins and perdition. There you will feel an unappeasable hunger for Christ's truth. There, instead of lukewarm, you will become ardent. Instead of pacified, you will become alarmed. Instead of learning the wisdom of this world, you will become foolish in Christ. She points out something from the book of Revelation. Uh, without, uh, She says, instead of lukewarm, you will become ardent. There's a part in the book of Revelation at the very end where 
Christ says, you are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm, therefore I spit you out. Meaning uh, not, not living a life that is wholly devoted, but halfway, a lukewarm faith, a faith that can come and go uh, in one's life without, without much difference. Right. This is this is a lukewarm faith. And so when he says you are lukewarm, I spit you out. She warns of um, becoming lukewarm instead of lukewarm. You will become ardent in the church. Uh, you will become uh, let's call it hot or cold uh, instead of pacified. You will become alarmed instead of learning the wisdom of this world. Which is the ultimate foolishness, you will become foolish in Christ, a foolishness that is wise, which is ultimately wisdom. Uh, quite beautiful. And then she finishes, and we will become fools in Christ because we knew we know not only the difficulty of this path, but also the immense happiness of feeling God's hand upon what we do. So there is this immense happiness, but it is not a peace uh, per se, uh, so much as as uh, as a joy that passes understanding. Right? Uh, this is really something because I think I believe that. There is a great temptation for many of us to go to church for our own spiritual welfare. And that is without argument that, that by going to church and by participating and praying that there is a spiritual we welfare that is received. What she speaks of, it seems, is where is our focus? Is our focus on our spiritual well-being or is our spiritual well-being a byproduct of what we ought to be doing, right? Which is reaching out to God and to each other. Uh, to our brothers and sisters, uh, whether whether they are next to us or whether they are uh, the poor at the door, uh, this making getting away from the egocentric of relating everyone and everything to ourselves, which can be done uh, e even by those who live their lives in the church, uh, not getting out of relating everything to ourselves. It's almost a reminder of the publican and the Pharisee. I, I still love this, where he says uh, the way that it's put, where it says uh, the, the Pharisee at the front, he, uh, he thus prayed with himself. This is the way it's put. He thus prayed with himself, uh, saying, I, I fast, I tithe. I, uh, he's, he's, he's saying how all the wonderful things that he does, right? So again, he's talking about himself, relating things to himself. Uh, and, and then thanking God for not making him, again, relating to himself, for not making him like this lowly publican who is back there. And the publican is simply saying, have mercy on me. So he is not the center. He is aware that God is the center, right? Because he has he has humility, experienced humility. Uh, he has conquered that egocentrism. Uh, and there are fathers who speak at length about that parable, about the publican and the Pharisee, and about that egocentrism. Right, that is important uh, and must be done away with for spiritual welfare. Uh, she, Mother Maria, is fighting that. She seems to be really fighting that in her writings to um, to to combat uh, and to advise against this egocentrism, uh, this privatization of faith. Right, there can be no privatization of the Orthodox faith, for the faith is is for all. Is, is, is made is on behalf of all and for all as we offer the spiritual gifts. This is the life, that this is the life, that we are not thinking of ourselves, but we are thinking of all on behalf of all and for all. And that our spiritual welfare comes as an extension of that, as an extension of that. Um, so she is, she is, she is quite special. Uh, she speaks at length about a lot of these things and when, we could read this again and again and come away with more and come away with more. I get that sense. I hope you do as well. Uh, we're going to close for the night, but uh, the for this week, read the last chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and uh, we'll speak about them next week. I hope this finds you well. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, you can always reach out. I leave my email here in the chat, and uh, may God grant you a blessed evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ is among us, he is and always shall be. Christos, post redinas, yes, de budet.